Well, hi there. It's Jonathan Faust here. I'm happy to see you. Great to have you here for this live stream. We're going to continue this series on the seven factors of awakening, laying down the tracks for what it means to have a really full and rich practice that's not only about releasing stress, but really about true freedom and cultivating your capacity for, for happiness. So before we launch in, couple of quick announcements, which will sound familiar if you have listened here before. Big thank you to Glenn Harrison, our producer, for making all this technology work. To the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for hosting this and for all the other classes and events happening in the D.C. area. Big, big, big thank you to Rita Moran and to Ray Maniocchi. The full Monday night experience starts at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time if you are interested to be guided expertly by Rita Moran in mindful movement to help you release stress and prepare yourself for this meditation and talk. Then afterward, it's a really wonderful thing to connect with like-minded people. So Ray is a masterful um, facilitator. Uh, feel free to join afterward. It's a conversation around practice, around the talk, around what it means to be mindful in your life. So thank you to Rita and to Ray for, for your offerings. Those links to their Zoom classes are on my website and on my Facebook page. Please do feel free. All of this is offered freely, so there's no direct compensation for, for what I do and for what we do. Um, it's all in the spirit of generosity and all part of the essential teachings and kind of um, applied Buddhism, where the Buddha said, these practices are priceless, so you can't charge. They're all offered freely, and if you'd like to freely support this, Thank you very, very much. You can make uh, donations through my um, through my website, jonathanfaust.com. Speaking of websites, I also have a newsletter, weekly and monthly. The weekly just gives you an update as to what's coming up. The monthly is kind of a recap and offers my best photography for the month. You can sign up for that on my website as well. Thank you so much for being here. Really, really appreciate it. We are going to explore in the following meditation and talk what it means to investigate. That is to turn attention to what's here, what's right now. It's an important part of practice. As you're ready, you might close your eyes. And our first question in this investigation is, how would your body like to move to prepare yourself for sitting quietly? So you might want to reach your arms up overhead. You might like to stretch out in any way. You might want to open your jaw. See if you can work, it any, work out any tension in your jaw. Move, flow. And then when you're ready, let yourself begin to settle in for this short meditation. One of the important elements in practice is arriving. And arriving happens through concentration, through paying attention. And one of the most effective ways to pay attention is on the direct sensations in your body. So we're going to explore kind of investigating contraction release. It's one of the most effective ways for moving into a more and more inner quiet. So if you like, you might make your hands into fists. Tighten up your fists and your forearms and your biceps and your triceps. Hold that tension. And if, you're, if you like, if it's comfortable for you, you don't have to do this. You might take in a long, deep breath. Hold the breath and concentrate on tightening the fists, the forearms, the biceps, and triceps. Hold, squeeze. And then release. And as you release, track that feeling of relaxation. Notice this essential practice of, con of contraction and then flowing into release. Notice how it might help you to become more absorbed, more intimately aware. And now, if you're ready, you can tighten up your forearms, your biceps, your triceps, muscles around the shoulders, muscles around the shoulder blades, and draw your shoulders up close to your ears. And again, only if it's comfortable for you, taking a long, deep breath, hold the breath, 
And as you hold the breath, again, accentuate the contraction. Hold and squeeze only to your comfort level. And when you're ready, relax. Lower the shoulders, relax the arms, relax the fingers. And again, just track and feel and investigate the quality of sensation flowing on the inside. One final time. Tighten up the fists, the forearms, biceps, triceps, muscles around the shoulders, muscles around the shoulder blades. Draw your shoulders up close toward your ears. Draw your navel in toward your spine. Draw in a long, deep inhalation and hold the breath, hold the contraction. If you like, you can pull all the muscles up toward your nose, turn your face into a raisin, feel the full contraction. And as you're ready, release and feel the movement from contraction and holding to releasing and to letting go. Softening, relaxing and feeling. Awareness of the body. Awareness of the feeling tone inside. The ground of practice. Notice if you could relax or soften even more throughout the whole body now. What could relax or let go? What could soften? And you might very gently now escort your attention to an anchor of your choosing. In this tradition, the anchor is in the senses, the movement of the breath, perhaps at the nostrils or the belly or the whole body breathing or perhaps the sound vibrations, or the feeling in the palms and fingers and thumbs, that sense of pulse or tingling or life force. Whatever anchor you choose for these next minutes, notice how intimately you can feel the point of contact. When you notice the mind naturally wandering, how gently can you bring your attention back to the experience of this breath, of these sound vibrations, or to this sense of aliveness in the palms? You might explore the following questions. How much more could you soften or relax through the whole body right now? How intimately can you feel your anchor from the inside? And you might explore in these minutes this two-part element of meditation. The first element, noticing what's happening as it happens. As I breathe, I'm aware of breathing in. 
As I breathe out, I'm aware of breathing out. The second element, noticing your relationship to what is happening. And you might investigate very, very gently this subtle movement of the mind, moving toward and moving away. Noticing when something pleasant arises, the, the mind's movement toward grasping and holding on. And when anything unpleasant arises, the movement to push it away. Relaxing even more. And investigating the movement of the mind in relationship to what's happening right now. What are you noticing right now? Can you let it be just as it is? Over this remaining minute or so, you might explore the following questions again. What could soften or relax inside right now? How intimately can you feel and experience your anchor from the inside? Is it possible to sense your relationship to what is happening right now? The movement toward, the movement away, or perhaps the quality to simply allow and let be. You might begin to deepen the breath a little bit. Let your body move and stretch in any way that feels good for you. Feel free to open your eyes or remain with them closed. The following talk, part two of seven, on the seven factors of awakening is really critical and sets up a distinction in this particular form of practice. It's one thing to bring your attention to the here and now. It's another to employ this very critical part of practice, the capacity to turn toward what is here and to investigate it, to investigate your relationship with it. This distinction is a key that can open you to finding freedom and possibility where it didn't exist before. Please enjoy the following talk. 
and many blessings in your practice. When I was in the Peace Corps in West Africa, I was sleeping in my little <laughs> my little hovel, and I, I slept on the floor, and I was having a dream that a, that a little puppy was was licking my hand. It was just such a sweet, just a sweet sense of connection with this puppy. And I I then kind of like stirred and I woke up and I, I looked at my hand and there was the biggest cockroach that I had ever seen. I think my years uh, of being in West Africa, I, I wasn't freaked out. I just uh, kind of like placed it to the side and tried to go back to bed. Tonight's talk is about looking closer at what is actually happening. And for me, it was around waking out of a dream state to realize reality. And that's very much a part of what this practice is all about, is kind of waking up out of your dream state to come in contact with what's actually, what's actually true. I'd like to talk a little bit about how, how this practice of meditation is really about cultivating insights into the nature of reality. That's the essence of it. And when you do that investigation, what you're exploring is what it's like to bring investigation or curiosity to the whole realm of energy and feeling in the body, inside, but also how it can be around investigating thoughts and beliefs. I also like to talk about some practical kind of pragmatic skills you can use to, to refine your capacity for investigation. This is all part of a series on, on these seven factors of, of awakening. Uh, last week, we talked about mindfulness, your capacity for, for observing life without the filter of greed, hatred, or delusion. And this is now about really looking closer, being curious and awake to what is here. A good number of years ago, um, some friends went through a very, very, very difficult time in their relationship. She was a teacher traveling a lot, and he was primarily home. And it turned out, kind of revealed that, that she had had an affair. And as you can imagine, the hurt, the betrayal, the guilt was crushing. And yet, somehow, decades later, they're still together. How did they move from that kind of hurt to, to healing. Uh, over the course of the talk, I'd like to kind of refer back to their story, because I think it's really illustrative, of how honest and authentic investigation can help you heal something that, that many, maybe other people aren't able to heal. You know, we all have these searing wounds. We, we all have these early experiences that shape our perception. You know, as I like to say somewhat ad nauseum, that some of us are, are outrage waiting to happen. You know, we're just waiting for, for anger to explode. Some of us are a sense of not good enough waiting to happen, or rejection waiting to happen, or not belonging waiting to happen, or, or life is a struggle waiting to happen. Meditation, non-judging awareness, can be a way of waking up to those patterns and reflecting on whether they're really, really true or not. And it's always this question of what is meditation all about? Like, what, what, why are you practicing? Is it to smooth out those, those stress lines around your eyes or to concentrate better or to lower your blood pressure? All those might happen. I don't know about the stress lines, but all those might happen. It's really, I think, about cultivating insights into the nature of reality. It's about seeing where you're caught and seeing how you can get free. Looking closely at where you're not happy and opening to what happiness is all about. So mindfulness is very much in a dance with investigation. Everything you need to know about liberation and happiness and being awake can be found through your powers of investigation. And by this, I mean it's your mind's capacity to observe what is happening in the present moment with wisdom. 
and with compassion. This quality of investigation is it's alert, it's, it's relaxed, it's without attachment to the results when it works. So I'd like to talk a little bit. I'm going to come back to my come back to those friends who went through that struggle, but to talk a little bit about how how we get caught. And referring back to a very uh, profound moment in my life when I was about five years old, I grew up on a farm in southeastern Pennsylvania in the Pennsylvania Dutch country. And when I was about five or six, I was standing out on the lawn behind the farmhouse. And um, I looked down and I saw that there was a snake that was coiled around my feet. Something primal in my little five-year-old brain, or maybe I was six, it just it just kicked off at the sight of that snake, and I freaked. <laughs> I just freaked out. I jumped about four feet in the air. I ran to the porch screaming and just stood there shaking. This is whole line you may have heard it was Mark Twain who said, when a cat sits on a hot stove, it'll never sit on a hot stove again, but it won't sit on a cold one either. Uh, in that same way, for a long time, I was that cat. I, I never, I would not stand on that patch of lawn again for anything. I was very cautious when I was outside and, and I kind of went through life gathering information about snakes. And a little bit after that, I watched this snake through the window. I watched a snake eat a frog, you know, where it distended its jaw and slowly pulled it in. Um, whenever we would go into northern Pennsylvania to where my dad grew up on a, on a farm, uh, we were always told to be aware of rattlesnakes. And I remember one day my dad killed a rattlesnake with a shovel. And I developed a pretty consistent thought. A thought was basically, snakes are bad. I had more encounters with snakes over my life. Well, once again, back in northern Pennsylvania, I think this was in high school, uh, doing some whitewater canoeing. I was uh, carrying the canoe on my shoulders down this rocky embankment, and I kicked over a big rock. A rattlesnake coiled, started rattling. The next thing I remember, I'm, I'm up by the pickup truck with the canoe still on my shoulders going, <laughs> I have no idea what happened. I think I just jumped about 60 feet. Later, when I was rock climbing in, in um, southern Utah in college, I was treated to the experience of, as I'm going up a rock face, hearing and feeling a rattlesnake at my feet. I couldn't see it, but I could feel it against the side of my climbing shoe. Another moment of present moment awareness. <clears throat> long story, but I, I waited for a long time. And then I just twitched my toe and it rattled again. And I just was hanging on the rock face waiting for the for the fangs. I got out of that one. Um, long story short, um, waited another really, really long time. And uh, a friend came kind of to the side of the crack and took my hand and kind of swung me away from the cliff face. But you know, if you think the same thought over and over and over again, the thought that snakes are bad and dangerous, um, it kind of turns into a belief. Snakes are bad. Snakes will kill you. And then that turns into a habit. So scanning for evidence pretty much wherever I go on how snakes are going to kill me and being very suspicious about the possibility of a snake somewhere. And that habit kind of informs your, your character being fearful. And then that informs your destiny. Like I'm never going outside again. <laughs> and this is, this kind of refers back to this model that I like to talk about how our experience arises from the moment. First, there's just this raw, unfiltered sensation. It's neither good nor bad. But then that sensation has a feeling tone in your body. I like it. I don't like it. Or eh, it's in between. That kicks in a thought. If you think that thought over and over and over again, the thought becomes a belief. That belief becomes your habit. That habit informs your character and that informs your destiny. I was in the Peace Corps in West Africa and in, in Niger, 
where we had the most deadly snake in the world. Quite often, farmers would uh, step into a, a nest when they were out in their fields, and the whole nest, they, they, would, they would bite multiple times. Really, really pretty bad news. And a little further south, there was a, a snake that could kill you the fastest in the world. It's called, it's called the black mamba, 100% fatality rate. Their venom contains these neurotoxins and it, it specializes in eating birds and small mammals. So once it, once it strikes, it, it, it needs for the animal to die right away so, so it can um, ingest it. They get really, really big, like up to like nine or 10 feet long. They hang out either on the ground or in trees, which is really comforting. And the Army, U.S. Army instructions, if you are bit by a black mamba, this is crazy. These are the instructions. Make sure you have your ID tags on and lie down in the open where they can find your body. So this phobia, <clears throat> my particular phobia around snakes. One summer, I was biking in Europe. And I stayed with a friend who, uh, who worked at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. And she invited me to come to work with her. Um, and she set me up on a little tour of the facility and amazing, amazing research that they're doing in kind of these tropical diseases and so forth, working with malaria and all kinds of other infectious d diseases. But where I spent most of my time was with this fellow who had a specialty in poisonous snakes and amphibians. And he had a room. <laughs> with every single poisonous snake and a few poisonous toads who were just free to hop around the room. And then he was on call. He had a beeper back then. People would call from all over the world describing the bite and then he and the symptoms and he would help them figure it out and also help to get venom to them if he could or uh, the, uh, the cure. So we're in this room and Every poisonous snake and toad in the world are kind of behind glass walls. And I was freaked, but I wasn't going to run out of the room screaming. I had that much uh, presence of mind. And then he walked around the room and he tapped on the glass all around the room. And the hooded cobras swayed and the rattlesnake hiss and the, the mambas, you know, did their thing. Rattlesnakes rattling. And there I was with all my phobias and on the other side of the glass, every poisonous snake and amphibian in the world. And there was something about that moment that was the beginning of a shift for me. I realized I don't want to be run by my fear of snakes. I don't want to miss out on life because of that old impression of a snake coiled around my feet when I was five. So I actually go outside a lot and I actually encounter lots of snakes now. I, I paddle on the Potomac River uh, quite a bit and there are lots of snakes in the summer. They're out there sunning themselves on the rocks. Uh, one time I came across this Virginia River snake that it must have been nine or 10 feet long. And I was able to kind of uh, paddle by it and kind of take it all in. I've seen huge copperheads uh, one thing you really need to be careful of in the summer on the Potomac is if you put your hand on a rock, make sure you check it out first. Um, a couple of years ago, Tara and I were just hiking in the woods around here in Northern Virginia, and a tree snake fell from about 60 feet up and landed right in front of us. And I actually picked up a snake not too long ago. It was a baby copperhead in our living room. So I've taken time to when it feels safe to look a little closer at my phobia. And, and if, if, you, if you had a phobia about snakes and you were to do desensitization therapy, it would go something like this. This is not, not, a, <laughs> not a perfect clinical example. But for example, you might talk to someone about your fear of snakes. And just talking about it might be helpful. And, and then your, your therapist might say, you know, <clears throat> would you like to see a, a book with pictures of snakes. <clears throat> well, maybe that would be a little frightening for you. <clears throat> but you'd hang out there and maybe you'd look at the pictures of snakes and you realize, well, I can actually see pictures of snakes and I'm not going to die. And you, that becomes kind of okay. 
And you might talk more about snakes and different encounters with snakes. And maybe at some point your therapist would say, well, you know, there's actually a snake in a cage in the office next door. Maybe that brings up some fear and you you recognize that and you be with that fear and you kind of self calm and you realize you're okay. And maybe another session, your therapist might say, well, would you like to just see the snake? You just, just to see it. And then perhaps if it feels safe, you, you work with that fear and you befriend it and you sense how it's like to self soothe and how to resource. And then you can actually, you can actually see the snake and realize that you're not getting activated in that old way. And then maybe you're invited to touch the glass and maybe at some point just to, to touch the snake or to hold it. But every step of reclaiming that phobia is a new edge of fear. And <clears throat> what will help you to heal that phobia is two things. First is mindfulness, your capacity to observe without judgment. And the second is your capacity and willingness to investigate, to investigate that arising sensation of fear, the arising sensation of the trauma response and your capacity to see it, recognize it, say hello to it, make room for it, bring compassion to it. This really points toward this practice of RAIN that we often talk about, R-A-I-N, to, to recognize what is presenting, to sense if you can allow it or accept it. The eye of RAIN is to investigate, to look closer. The end is to nurture what you find with a sense of empathy, compassion, or kindness. When we can call on this investigative power, things get really interesting. I talk a lot about this line, the line between what you're aware of and what you're not aware of. Above the line is everything that you're conscious of in your life. And below that line in that circle is all the unseen, unfelt forces in your life. For me, working with my snake, phobia, there's a lot of fear and anxiety under the line. But by recognizing it, allowing it, investigating it in a way that felt safe, bringing kindness to it, I'm a little more able to be with reptiles. They're not my best friends, but I do have a capacity where I don't feel quite so paralyzed anymore. And actually, I get curious because I see a lot of snakes and now I, uh, I'm actually curious as to what they do and how they do it. So how do you investigate? What, where, does, how does, where do you start with investigation? Well, one area is the sense of the, the raw data of sensation and feeling tone. We talked about like the raw data feeling and then the feeling tone. And then what arises from there is the thoughts and beliefs. You can investigate those. You can investigate your habits. You can look at your, your character structure. You can look at your sense of destiny, where you're heading. All these are kind of ripe for investigation. But what's very, very powerful is that foundational sense of where does it live on the inside? As, they, as we like to say, your issues are in your tissues. That fundamental arising of the feeling tone in the body is primary and fundamental. And for many of us who are more, more intellectual, more head oriented, we tend to want to skip that part, but quite often that's the foundation of your experience. So back to this couple. For her, this traveling teacher, searing guilt. She was actually felt so, she felt almost mute. She was, she was so shut down. We talk in this practice of how when you're wounded, that's the first arrow. But then every time we get caught in self-judgment or aversion, it's like a second and a third and a fourth arrow. And she was racked with so much guilt and so much self-derision that she was really kind of paralyzed. For him, hurt, anger, disappointment. For him, it wasn't being mute, it was outrage. It was feeling incensed and feeling betrayed. 
I think all of us, we've all had hurts in life. No one I know hasn't in some way felt betrayed in some way. Classically, when we feel hurt, we, we close in around that trauma and we move into the trauma response. Fear and helplessness will show up as some form of self-protective anger, um, ill will, judgment, blame. We, we, we unconsciously lash out as a way of self-protection. For others, our way of saving ourselves is disassociation. Just disconnect from the body and go into thinking, go to your happy place. And there we lose a sense of even what we're feeling. The third classic response is freeze. We just, we freeze up and we shut down. And that classic response is if you've ever seen a little, a little newborn fawn in the woods, they freeze. Because if you freeze, maybe no one will see you and the predator will walk by. So we all have these traumas, if you will. And again, trauma, fear, and helplessness. So if you want to be awake in your life and you want to be fully alive, you may have some dues <laughs> to pay. You have to befriend all the areas where you don't feel alive all those issues in your tissues. And this is where the practice gets powerful. You know, quite often for many people, when you begin a mindfulness practice, it feels so good. This, this taste of non-judging awareness and connecting with a sense of ease in the body. Inevitably, what happens for many is this natural organic arising of, oh, well, now that you're accessing non-judging awareness and a sense of presence, what about, what about this? Let's look at this. So investigation, a very powerful form of investigation is, can you move from the story to how it lives on the inside? And so for him, as he began to sense this, how this issue was in his tissues, was a very, very, very deep, almost a searing feeling in his heart and in his solar plexus. And as he examined it, he described it as something ancient, just a sense of just feeling left behind, a sense that, that, he, he just, he, that in his heart of hearts, he knew he couldn't trust. So in this practice of RAIN, recognizing that, a sense if you could allow it, investigating the the felt sense of how that lives on the inside. And then as he explored bringing a little empathy, a little compassion to it, he, he felt a, a little bit of soothing, not, not a whole lot of healing, but just a sense of like, okay, I see you and I care. That's the beginning of, of the lubrication that can allow you to let go. And for her to shut down, close down, she actually couldn't feel below her neck. <clears throat> and just a deep sense of how untrustworthy she was, how bad she was. Now, the interesting thing is when you are working with undigested experiences, many of them are very, very light. So in this practice of, of rain, just recognizing it sometimes is liberating. You know, some, some, some thoughts are self-liberating. As soon as you recognize them, <clears throat> they kind of lose their power and they dissipate. Sometimes it requires a little more, okay, let me give this some space. You know, can I allow it? And just the allowing gives it a little more room. Sometimes it requires a really deep dive into identifying what you're feeling on the inside. Sometimes it requires just a real, really deep sense of patience. What I found when it comes to healing those kind of core wounds, you can't push the river here. You can't force it. It requires a real sense of gentleness. It's almost like, like holding a baby. It doesn't have words or holding, a, holding an animal. That sense of real, real care. Like, what do you need right now? It's so foundational to our practice. So foundational. This sense of the willingness just to feel and to hold it in, in kindness. 
so many of our of our wounds are so deep for me five years old that's a that's a pretty core not almost not having language the only way that can be held is in the light of investigation what is this and with that sense of mindfulness holding it without judgment so as they went on to practice both both practitioners they just kept coming back to how they were holding it on the inside not trying to figure it out that's so key just to get more familiar with it that was the practice and sometimes there can be a shift over time. Just a sense of, this is what it is. I care about this. Let me just hold this. And over time, there can be, there can be a shift. Quite often, that shift is quite profound because so it's almost happening beneath conscious thought. It's, it's like when a, when a child comes and the child just really needs a hug. <laughs> when you can offer that for yourself. It doesn't have to be figured out. But another form of investigation is to explore the whole level of thoughts and beliefs. So in exploring that, it's very helpful to look at what's the core belief you have about the situation. And for her, her core belief was, I'm a, I am a bad person. And for him, it was, yes, you are a bad person. <laughs> You can get locked into that thought for the rest of your life. And because I'm somewhat limited on time, I'm going to just offer a quick summary. This beautiful work by Byron Katie that I find so, so helpful. Her book, um, As It Is. No, Loving What Is. <laughs> I, I think that's what it is. <laughs> She talks beautifully around identifying that core belief, which takes some digging. And then to ask yourself, is it true? Do I, real, do I know this to be absolutely true? And quite often the first response is yes, I'm, I'm thinking it's gotta be true. But you really ask yourself, do you know that to be true? And then to investigate, what is it like when I think that thought? And primarily what I've found over the years is that's a somatic inquiry. What does it feel like? How does that thought live on the inside? And then to inquire, who am I without this thought? And just listen deeply. There's more to that modality. But for her to really sense I'm a bad person and to really sense what it was like inside to feel like she's a bad person, to trace that back, that the, the deep sense of guilt to sense how the somatic roots of that thought. And then when she had a really deep sense of how old that thought was, how, how, how long that had been living, how long she'd been carrying it, to ask that, that samurai sword question, who are you without that thought? Part of the breakthrough for her was when she said, I was so lonely traveling by myself all those years. I had, I had asked you, she said to her husband, I asked you again and again, if you would come and travel with me. I'm so, so sorry for the pain that I've caused. And for him, when he heard that, just that core, core, cry of of how lonely she was and how she had asked him to join her on the road again and again and again he said it's true you did ask me again and again to travel with you and i had other things that i wanted to do and i didn't understand how hard it was for you to be on your own all this time that was the beginning of, of a shift that has allowed them to be together for quite a few decades now. So this becomes an integral part of, of practice. If you want to be alive and awake in your life, 
there has to be a willingness to develop mindfulness, to develop this capacity to observe without judgment, and a willingness to look closer, to really investigate what is this? What, what is this feeling I'm having? How does this want me to be with it? It's easy to get lost in thoughts and just try to rearrange them. <laughs> but this practice of investigation becomes a very powerful way of moving from blame to taking a deep sense of responsibility for how you are holding and how you're living your life. But this brings up an interesting question, one that I have certainly struggled with and, and one that a lot of people will bring up, particularly when you've, when you've got a really deep and rich meditation practice established. Or let's say you're on a meditation retreat where you've got a lot of time on your hands. And that is the question, it's like, well, should I be working on stuff in my meditation practice? Should I be scouring for material that I can, that I can investigate? you know, that I can recognize and name and really be with. And my response kind of comes from my, my own experience is like, should you be looking for stuff to work on? I mean, this is my take. Don't worry, it, it'll find you. I always come back to this fasting analogy. I used to supervise a lot of fasts for a couple of years and quite often when you create this container and you take away the uh, your traditional food that can be kind of toxic and you're doing juices or a mono diet or whatever you're doing, <clears throat> there is this natural organic kind of healing crisis that occurs where when your body is ready, it starts throwing toxins out of your system and you start, you start experiencing the, you know, the bad breath or your skin breaking out or digestive issues or all kinds of stuff. There's an innate intelligence inside that if you pause and if you create that space and very much like, like fasting where you're taking in really, really good food, when you're drinking in present moment, non-judging awareness as best you can, inevitably whatever wants to be healed is going to find its way in its own innate organic way. I've been so many meditation retreats that I've done where I'm meditating and I'm thinking, not this. I thought I was done with this. <laughs> and if I can take the time to say, okay, welcome. Let's have tea. Let's have a conversation. It becomes an opportunity for, for healing and opening. So in a little bit of time I have left, <clears throat> I'd like just to talk a little bit about how you use this practice internally. Uh, one time on a meditation retreat, I was feeling disengaged and doubtful. You know, I had done a number of retreats and like, ugh, more of the same, more of the same. Oh, guess what? The 50,000 thoughts I'm having today seem to be identical to the 50,000 thoughts I had yesterday. And I was in a little bit of a mind state of like, why, why bother? You know, my mind is out of control. I have no self-discipline. Who do I think I am trying to even meditate? So this was a, this was a doubt attack. Why bother? And when I, when I recognized after a whole lot of muddy thinking that this was actually kind of the weather system of doubt, it became an opportunity to sense, well, can I, can I actually investigate doubt? So can I allow it? Can I make room for it? And so I began to turn my attention to first the somatic. Well, well what does this state that I'm in feel like on the inside? Can I, can I name it? And I could feel a tightness. I, it was a contraction. There was, there was kind of a heaviness. The interesting thing about being on a, on a meditation retreat is there are people cooking for you. There are people cleaning up after you there's nothing to do. Your, your job is just to be. So like, okay, I guess this is going to be an afternoon of just being with doubt. So I, I wasn't trying to shift it or move it or anything like that. I was just trying to be with it. You know, and I, and I just sat with it. Like, 
curiosity. So, so what is the state that I'm in right now? And I, and I kind of, I, I kind of had this sense of, uh, like a, you know, a wired and tired child, you know, where you're just, you're the child is inconsolable. And what they really, really need is they need a nap, you know, they, 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 they just, they need a hug and they need a nap, but it's the last thing that they want. And I kind of saw that inside of like, you know, like, you know, I'm tired, I'm wired, eh, I don't know what I need. And just, just recognizing that child, that tired child, it kind of brought up a little bit of a kind of a spontaneous smile, like a little sense of empathy. And I, and I just thought to myself, you know, buddy, it's been a long day. It, it's okay. And what's so interesting is by taking the time to investigate that sort of discouraged, doubtful, ugh, why bother thing, and just sort of being with the feeling of it without trying to fix it, and having that sort of empathic response arise, my mood completely lightened. Suddenly, it was just easy to stay present. I felt kind of a brightness inside, and suddenly everything felt a little bit sharper. It felt a little bit clearer. And it was so profound for me that this weather system of doubt felt, it just felt permanent. I felt like I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna move through this. But by investigating with mindfulness and bringing in some empathy and compassion, it was like the clouds dispersed and suddenly it was clear skies again. And this is one of the most interesting things I find in, in practice is that when you feel stuck, when you feel caught, it feels permanent. It feels like, like this is it forever and ever and ever. But remembering that if you can bring attention to it, if you can call on your practice, mindfulness, non-judging awareness, and the willingness to have tea with whatever arises, what feels permanent can shift quickly. That also includes the really, really positive, wonderful, expansive states as well. They, they too, of course, are going to change. So investigation can be on this whole level of the felt sense of the body. You can also investigate what it's like in your mind through thoughts and beliefs. And then there's just sort of this whole sense of, well, what is reality? And part of this sense of exploring what is real is recognizing these, these qualities of reality. First, the law of impermanence. Anything born of causes and conditions is subject to change. Remembering that how you're relating to what is changing has direct implications in how much stress and suffering you'll have. If there's resistance to the degree you resist, that suffering will persist. To the degree you can let it be, you'll feel more free. The third characteristic of reality is sees into the nature of self, that, that part of who you are is conditioned, subject to change, but perhaps there's something in you, you, that is unchanging. These three qualities can be enormously helpful when you're investigating at anything and everything, a nitya impermanence. How is this changing? Exploring dukkha or the nature of stress or suffering. What's my attitude toward this right now? Is there some form of reaching or clinging or holding on? Is there some form of pushing away or aversion or judgment? Is there some form of, of confusion where I'm really not seeing clearly what this is? Or is there some quality of, of allowing and letting be? So what I find in this balance of my own meditation practice is that investigation is, is held in balance with concentration. In my practice, I find it much helpful, much more helpful to first to gather attention using concentration. 
Because otherwise, the mind is just this, as Ramana Maharshi described it, this drunken monkey stung by scorpions. It's just lurching from one thing to the next. So learning how to concentrate the mind, learning how to cultivate one-pointed awareness is just so, so critical. But once you've arrived, and once you have this sense of like, this is here and now, then this new faculty begins to awaken your capacity to, to investigate. And I think this whole two-part definition of meditation is so foundational, at least for me. Noticing what's happening as it's happening, that's concentration. As I breathe in, I'm aware of breathing in. As I breathe out, I'm aware of breathing out. Investigation reveals your relationship to what is happening. What's the attitude in my mind right now? Am I resisting or am I, am I allowing? With investigation, you have this power of sorting through the complexity of your life to really identify truly what is happening in the here and now and to explore how you can be with it. This practice will not only perhaps help you release those stress lines around your eyes, but it can also open the possibility of greater happiness and greater freedom in your life, no matter what is arising. Let's close with just a few minutes in this short yet brief yet truncated meditation. If you like, you can close your eyes. And if you would, Take three slow and full deep breaths. Just notice the effect of concentrating your attention on your breathing, how it, how it gathers awareness in the here and now. Can you sense this quality of mindfulness, your capacity to to observe what is arising without judgment. And can you sense this quality of, of investigation, the investigative mind, observing what is happening with wisdom, alert, relaxed, and awake? In these final moments, you might just take a, take a few moments just to reflect on, on all that is going on in this world outside you. And you might take a moment to wish yourself well. Imagine yourself filled with a sense of ease. Imagine and feel your capacity for inner peace. Imagine and feel yourself feeling safe from inner and outer harm. And imagine and feel yourself free from stress, free from suffering. And as you deepen the breath, just sense your willingness to be filled with the sense of ease, peace, and freedom. And imagine you could broadcast that feeling out to all beings in all directions without discrimination. May all beings feel 
peace, safety, and free. And in these final moments, imagine your life informed by this sense of ease and peace, that you might respond to the challenges of your life with great wisdom and boundless compassion. As you're ready now, you might slowly deepen your breath. As you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I truly hope that this is helpful in your life and that you might respond to the inner and outer challenges of life with, with an open heart and with an open mind. Thank you again for your time and attention.